morning, and welcome to the Lemonade, Inc. first quarter 2022 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Yael Wisner-Levy, VP Communications. Please go ahead. Good morning and welcome to Lemonade's first quarter 2022 earnings call. My name is Yael Wisner-Levy and I'm the VP Communications at Lemonade. Joining me today to discuss our results are Daniel Schreiber, co-CEO and co-founder, Shai Winninger, co-CEO and co-founder, and Tim Bixby, Chief Financial Officer. A letter to shareholders covering the company's first quarter 2022 financial results is available on our investor relations website, investor.lemonade.com. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that management's remarks on this call may contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Actual results may differ materially from those indicated by these forward-looking statements as a result of various important factors, including those discussed in the risk factors section of our Form 10-K filed with the SEC on March 1, 2022, and our other filings with the SEC. Any forward-looking statements made on this call represent our views only as of today, and we undertake no obligation to update them. We will be referring to certain non-GAAP financial measures on today's call, such as adjusted EBITDA and adjusted gross profit, which we believe may be important to investors to assess our operating performance. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are included in our letter to shareholders. Our letter to shareholders also includes information about our key operating metrics, including a definition of each metric, why each is useful to investors, and how we use each to monitor and manage our business. With that, I'll turn the call over to Daniel, who will begin with a few opening remarks. Daniel? Thank you, Yael, and thank you to everybody for joining us this morning to review our Q1 results and to allow us to update you on our expectations from the remainder of Q2 and indeed the remaining of 2022. I'm very happy to say that the year kicked off with a very strong first quarter. Both our top line and our bottom line came in ahead of expectations as Inforce Premium, or IFP, stood at $419 million, while our adjusted EBITDA loss for the quarter came in at $57 million. This quarter, we also hit a big milestone for the company, as it was the first full quarter in which Lemonade offered the full suite of insurance products, that is, renters, home, life, pet, and car, in one market. For the first time, a customer could mega bundle or get all four Lemonade policies that meet their insurance needs in one app with bundle discounts and with the ease Lemonade is known for. So far, this mega bundle is available in Illinois and Tennessee alone, and I think these markets offer an early peek into how meaningful growing with our customers can become as we roll out these products nationwide. Growing with our customers has long been a central plank of our strategy, and the early dynamics we see in both Illinois and Tennessee reinforce that. For example, in one quarter alone, we saw bundle rates in Illinois climb 40% versus the rest of the country. To the extent that this is indicative of things to come, it is very significant. Customers with two Lemonade products outspent the average single product when we get to customers with all four products in these two markets, that were indeed annual dollars jumped during Q1 to 90%. So while it's early days and small numbers, Illinois serves as an encouraging case study. As has been our strategy since day one, we want to be there for our customers as they go through predictable life cycle events, moving, buying a home, getting a car, starting a family, all of these are events with dramatic growth implications for insurance spend and with little corresponding marketing spend on our part. This dynamic not only boosts our bottom line, it is also the fastest contributor relative to Q1 2021. Premiums for customers with two Lemonade products grew at a pace of 140%, and premiums for customers with three products jumped 300 190% during that same period. 
So I will touch on the second plank of our strategy, winning with technology, in a minute. But before that, I'd like to say a word about two changes at our board of directors. The first is that we recently announced that Karen Seidman Becker will step down from our board of directors, effective at the conclusion of the annual meeting in June. Karen's company, Clear, recently IPO'd, and Karen was also appointed to the board of Home Depot. As a result of concerns regarding overboarding, which means serving on too many public boards, and to avoid any questions around good governance, Karen will depart from our board. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Karen for the extraordinary contribution she has made to our company over her four-year tenure at Lemonade. She has left an indelible mark on the company and has provided incisive and actionable counsel for Shai and I at key junctures. In an unrelated change, Joel Cutler has today tendered his resignation from the Lemonade board. Joel has recently learned of a serious health issue and he will be undergoing major surgery later this week. Joel has served on our board since November 2016, and it would be hard to overstate the impact he has had on Lemonade, nor the esteem and affection Shai and I hold for him. On behalf of all your friends at Lemonade, Joel, we want to wish you a speedy and complete recovery. We are kicking off a search for two new board members, and we'll, of course, update you as those searches conclude. And with that, let me hand over to Shai for some more color on our loss ratio. Shai, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Last quarter, I spoke about measures we've taken to address underwriting profitability in our quest to achieve loss ratios of all enemies products within a 75% target. We've always believed that building a technology-powered insurance company is the way to achieve best-in-class customer experience, efficiency, and prediction of risk. When it comes to loss ratios, our internal dashboards show increasingly profitable cohorts with every month that passes. We're now using our fifth generation of machine learning LTV prediction models, and these provide an ever-improving estimate of the loss ratio of each new customer, as well as their likelihood to churn or cross-sell. The combination of these factors supports our real-time view of customer lifetime value. Despite a 90% gross loss ratio for the quarter, these dashboards show that the business we generated in Q1 is expected to have a lifetime loss ratio comfortably within our 75% gross loss ratio target. As we've spoken about before, loss ratios are lagging indicators, and changes in pricing, underwriting, and segmentation take time to develop and then get approved through regulatory filings, and yet more time to earn in. This lag between action and results is a structural reality of insurance which is why we use predictive machine learning models rather than backward-looking loss ratios in our day-to-day -day management. As much of the broader insurance industry has reported, Q1 loss ratios were more significantly impacted by inflation as claims are quickly adjusted for inflation while rates can take months to adjust. We've been working hard to combat this with corrective measures and in the past year have filed about 100 applications for rate changes. As regulatory approvals come in, we look forward to bringing rates back in line with risk. So while our target multi-year average loss ratio below 75% remains unchanged, it's important to remind our shareholders that while loss ratios spike from time to time, we have reinsurance in place to help insulate us from such bumps. Indeed, this quarter we're reporting a 23% gross profit margin at a better than expected EBITDA notwithstanding the heightened loss ratio. And now, over to you, Tim. Great, thanks, Shai. I'll give a bit more color on our Q1 results, as well as expectations for the second quarter and the full year, and then we'll take your questions. We had another strong quarter of growth, driven by additions of new customers, as well as a continued increase in premium per customer. Enforced premium grew 66% in Q1, as compared to the prior year, to $419 million. We believe that this metric captures the full scope of our top line growth before the impact of reinsurance and regardless of the timing of customer acquisition during the quarter. Premium per customer increased 22% versus the prior year to $279. And this increase was driven by a combination of increased value of policies over time, as well as a continuing mix shift toward higher value homeowner and pet policies. As in the prior quarter, the majority of the growth in premium per customer in Q1 was driven by product mix shift, including cross-sales, 
and the remaining 20% from increased coverage levels in pricing. Gross earned premium in Q1 increased 71% as compared to the prior year to $96 million, roughly in line with the increase in enforced premium. Revenue in Q1 increased 89% from the prior year to $44 million, and our gross loss ratio was 90% for Q1 21 as compared to 96% in the preceding quarter. Operating expenses, excluding loss and loss adjustment expense, increased 68% in Q1 as compared to the prior year. This is primarily driven by increased technology-related personnel expense, stock-based compensation expense, and legal and professional fees, partially offset by the impact of increased sales and marketing efficiency. We also continued to add new Lemonade team members in all areas of the company in support of customer and premium growth and to support geographic product expansion, and thus saw increases in each of the other expense lines. Global headcount grew 76% versus the prior year to 1,162, with a greater growth rate in product development and underwriting teams. Notably, headcount growth was just 20% when compared to six months ago, as we are seeing more efficiency gains in personnel expense in recent quarters. Our net loss was $74.8 million in Q1, or $1.21 per share, as compared to the $49 million loss we reported in the first quarter of 2021. While our adjusted EBITDA loss was $57.4 million in Q1, as compared to $41.3 million in the first quarter of 2021. Our total cash, cash equivalents, and investments ended the quarter at $1 billion, reflecting primarily a use of cash for operations of $39 million during the first quarter. Now with these goals and metrics in mind, I'll outline our specific financial expectations for the second quarter and an updated full year 2022. For the second quarter 2022, we expect enforced premium at June 30 of between $445 and $450 million, gross earned premium of $103 to $105 million, revenue between $46 and $48 million, an adjusted EBITDA loss between $70 and $65 million, stock-based compensation expense of approximately $15 million, and capital expenditures of approximately $4 million. And for the full year 2022, please note that we expect the Metro Mile transaction will close during Q2, and that our annual enforced premium is expected to grow approximately 70% during 2022. The guidance that follows, however, excludes the expected impact of the closing of the Metro Mile acquisition. At year-end, we expect enforced premium of between $535 and $545 million, gross earned premium between $426 and $430 million, revenue between $205 and $208 million, and adjusted EBITDA loss of between $280 and $265 million, and stock-based compensation expense of approximately $60 million, and capital expenditures of approximately $14 million. And as we noted last quarter, we do continue to expect that 2022 will be our year of peak EBITDA losses. With that, I would like to turn the call back over to Daniel. Daniel? Thanks, Tim. As is our practice, we'll now turn to questions most upvoted by our shareholders on the SAE platform. And the first one is from the paper bag investor, um, also by Darren Q. And it is, why has there been no or little insider buying even as the market cap of Lemonade has dropped? I'll say that, st state the obvious, that stocks have clearly um, taken a spectacular tumble in recent months. Lemonade has dropped about 50% year to date. Um, and this is fairly typical of what's really happened across the tech growth um, sector. Um, I'd like to believe for that reason that it says more about macroeconomic trends and cycles of investor sentiment than about Lemonade specifically. But turning to the specifics of the question, I understand and often see the interest um, that people have in insider buying and selling. Um, I have to say honestly for myself, um, I take little to no interest in it. Um, I have not once, as best I can recall, I have not once asked Lemonade's officers or board members or even my partner, Shai, with whom I discuss everything, not once have we discussed whether or why he is buying or selling or they are buying or selling shares, literally not once. Um, people buy and sell shares for many reasons, and I've never found this to be a helpful gauge of 
um, anybody's commitment or faith in Lemonade. Um, in any event, since the question is asked not about the actions of the company for whom I'm authorized to speak, but of individuals who work here for whom I cannot, let me just answer um, for myself. I have an incredibly high level of conviction in the long-term prospects of Lemonade and its shares, and indeed the majority of our family's wealth is in a single stock, LMND. So um, I expect that to be true for many years to come, and I expect you would hear similar sentiments from all insiders. And I do hope that that addresses the concern that underlines the question. And the second question is a compound question by uh, Chawak, um, and it reads as follows. What are some of the indicators that you track to analyze the AI engine efficacy? How do you tackle inflationary environments where premiums are charged in today's currency and claims must be paid in tomorrow's? And how do you guard against financial implications of rare events? Okay, so that's obviously several questions, and let me work through them um, from last to first. So we guard against rare events through um, reinsurance. That's uh, been a, a massive um, uh, a way in which we've really avoided the worst surprises along the years and continue to. Beyond that, as we launch new geographies and new products, that diversification actually is very protective as well. Um, rare events that hit homeowners in California don't usually hurt pet owners in California and don't hurt homeowners across the U.S., let alone in Europe. So being diversified geographically and product-wise is a great protection against those rare events as well. So I think dampens their impact. Um, the second question um, was really about inflation, and that too was touched on um, earlier. But let me take the opportunity to add some color for the, of the, of the board, kind of an examples of the board actions that we're taking. So. Um, for example, on uh, homeowners, um, we are filing for rate increases. We're, we're filing for base rate increases really across the USA, and we're doing that for home, condo, and renters, indeed for PET as well. Um, and we expect to have new rates filed for about 90 plus percent of our book of business across those products, home, condo, renters, and PET, before the quarter is out. In addition for homeowners, um, We've implemented an automatic update to our assessment of the costs that would be associated with repair or re rebuilding of each home, so that any inflation in the cost of construction or materials should be captured in correspondingly higher limits that the system will automatically assess, and by extension, automatically higher rates. Now, this will apply both to new policies um, and to existing policies when they renew and we expect to have that entirely operational um, before the end of this quarter as well. Uh, finally, for car, we think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, car definitely as a sector within the insurance industry has, has been terribly hit, perhaps worse hit by inflation. Um, but since we are new to this business, we don't have a, um, all the filings that need updating. In fact, all of our filings are very much current and were uh, and submitted with full awareness of these inflationary pressures, so we don't anticipate having to take a further rate in car in the near term, um, but we will keep our finger on the pulse there clearly. Finally, turning to the AI question, well, in accordance with best practices, we will use multiple metrics for measuring our machine learned models and predictions. Uh, for example, for binary decisions, such as classifiers, we typically use a methodology known as AUC, which stands for Area Under the Curve, and we use the Gini score for ordering challenges like rank ordering risks. Now, we use AI throughout our organization, throughout our business, from marketing efficiency, optimization, to underwriting, to fraud detection, to claims handling, et cetera. So in many areas of our business, the AI acts autonomously, um, but in several areas, like fraud detection or underwriting declamations or claim rejections, the AI makes recommendations or flags things which humans then review and make a decision on. Um, and in those instances, the human decisions establish a ground truth, and that serves both as a benchmark for the AI efficacy, but also as a training set to make it continuously improve. Um, I hope that fully answers that question. Um, another question comes, again, from the paper bag investor, and it asks about whether Lemonade would release loss ratios on a byproduct basis in order to enable a better assessment of the AI impact on our, um, on our underwriting? I think that's a very fair question. Um, it's one that we do discuss from time to time, and I, I saw paper bag that you also posted a question about 
an investor day in which we would share more information about AI, and I, I see these as related questions. So both about our AI and about our byproduct loss ratios and perhaps cohort loss ratios. Um, but there is a real trade-off, um, and that's something that we have to always bear in mind because information that helps our investors can also help our competitors, which in turn hurts our investors. Um, Lemonade is closely watched by the rest of the industry, and while our detailed filings are public um, by law, our detailed results are not, and that makes it harder for competitors to know which aspects of our business to copy because absent those uh, results, it's harder for them to close that learning loop. Um, we do share in the last quarter, for example. Um, and in general, I, I'll say that we anticipated this tension um, between wanting to be more transparent but also wanting to protect areas of our business where we think there is some exposure. We address this in our founder's letter, and let me perhaps just wrap up here by reading the relevant paragraph. It reads as follows. We are transparent except when we are not. We will explain why we zig or zag and be forthright about our past mistakes and future plans, except when revealing that information might hurt the business and its disclosure is not required by law. And by disposition, we continue there. We are transparent and default to sharing more rather than less, but we know that transparency is subject to diminishing returns and at some point negative returns. We try to be guided by that. Okay. And the final question comes from Antonio P, and it asks for an update on the Metro Mile acquisition and integration. Um, Antonio, very happy to share that almost all of the preconditions to closing the Metro Mile deal have been met. Um, Metro Mile's shareholders approved the deal with a 95% majority. What we need now really is approval from insurance regulators, specifically in Delaware, where Metro Mile is domiciled, and then the transaction will close. Our estimate all along has been that um, we'll be able to do that in this quarter, in Q2, and I'm still hopeful that that will happen. It would not be a shock if it slips into early Q3, but our best estimate remains as it was Q2. And the preparatory work has really gone very, very well. The teams have gotten to know each other, and we are, have every reason really to believe that the integration will be hugely successful and very, very speedy. Um, with that, let me hand the call over to the operator so we can take some questions from our friends on the street. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star than one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question is from Michael Phillips of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for all the comments on, on the loss ratio that, that everybody provided. Um, what, what I didn't hear, and maybe if, if you have it, if you want to share, was was there any impact? Um, obviously, we were comparing to, to last year, but it's pretty big impacts. But any impact on any kind of storms or, or catastrophe losses that would impact the 90%? So uh, no, what I would call it from a significant cats or notable cats, but there is every quarter uh, a, a um, you know, a baseline level of cat, uh, so nothing along the lines of URI or similar that we saw a year ago. So I would categorize it as sort of a, a typical um, relatively quiet quarter from a cat perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, you, you, Tim, you, you mentioned in your comments that kind of a, the impact on the loss ratio from the mix shift, um, and, and you, you said that last quarter too. Last quarter you, you said uh, – um, that there was, you know, with your renters, uh, well, this quarter you said, uh, how, how much of it was, uh, how much of your business is, is, is now renters? I think last quarter you said it was less than half. Can you talk about that and how much of the shift from homeowners then uh, impacted the loss ratio in this quarter, too? Can you talk about the, the shift to homeowners from renters and the impact on the loss ratio? Yeah, I would I would think of the mixed shift as, as continuing its pace of the last several quarters. Um, we don't give an exact breakdown uh, currently, but uh, as we did mention, we recently crossed over, you know, from having renters above 50% to below 50%. Uh, it it's, uh, continues to decline as a share of the total, but relatively slowly. Um, 
a contributor to the loss ratio in the quarter. It was certainly primarily the mix shift, the discontinued rate of mix shift. Um, but also fair to say that that the inflation impact um, is starting to start, starting to be you know visible in the numbers that affects home more than uh, pet or renters, but it will you know ultimately uh, potentially affect all all of the product lines. So um, primarily mix shift uh, to a lesser extent um, some of the inflation impacts. Okay, thank you. That's it for now. Appreciate it. The next question is from Matt Carletti of JMP. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Uh, Daniel, you gave some, some uh, helpful stats on some of the, the bundling take up, particularly in uh, Illinois, I think, where you have four products live. I was hoping you could help us understand kind of the cadence by which we might get more states that look like Illinois, kind of, you know, how how the rollout will be in terms of getting more kind of three and four product states. Maybe. With the closing of um, Metro Mile will see a, a sudden kind of jump in those states. So we are planning our launches of and so as not to overlap too much with what's already in existence and that we expect to inherit pretty quickly function change once the Metro Mile deal closes. Okay, great. And then just one other one, um, I think both, you know, you alluded to it with kind of commentary on the market and, and Tim as well, just with kind of, you know, 22 being peak EBITDA losses. I was hoping you could update us maybe on a little more longer-term view of, of Lemonade's path to profitability, particularly given um, kind of the recent changes in at least the market market, uh, you know, demands. Sure. Matt, let me kind of give you a few high-level comments, and then if Tim uh, has anything to add, I'll, I'll turn to him. It's an opportune time to remind, as a matter of policy, Lemonade does not and never has sold products or maintained campaigns we don't believe to be marginally profitable. Um, so even though we are reporting losses that are in terms of promoting uh, or acquiring customers, or all ones where we think the CAC to LP it's been hovering at or around a three to one ratio. It can be misleading because you're selling dollars for 90 cents, but that's just not the case. The reason it is skewed the way it is is because the costs are borne all up front since we tend to be predominantly a consumer advertising, so we take the hack hit right at the beginning. That is then compounded by the fact that year one loss ratios are the highest. So all of our year one customers have the full brunt of that. But we are able to model out their lifetime loss ratios, and we have every confidence and reason to believe, and the historical data has proven that our models are doing this pretty well, every reason to believe that they will return something in the order of a 3x return on every dollar that we're spending. But since we're growing fast, an increasing portion of our substantial portion of our business is still first-year customers, and even though they will be profitable over their lifetime, they're not profitable in the same accounting period, and that is the predominant dynamic that, that's driving losses. The reason I'm delaying on this is because as our denominator grows, as our book grows, the percentage, even though we're adding more and more customers, the percentage of year one customers declines, and that happens naturally just through arithmetic, and that is why we're able to forecast peak losses pretty soon as those historical investments that we made in products and customers start giving that return on investment that we've long since spoken about. And I think all of that by way of answering your question, which is that this isn't a major strategic shift. This is something that we have planned and anticipated and worked towards really forever. Um, this is, as I said, the arithmetic doing what it does, which is that um, older cohorts are showing they're more profitable and contributing um, to the underlying part of the business and newer cohorts or a smaller percentage, and this thing works its way out. So we are continuing pretty much along the same strategy that we've been a, 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 along all along. <clears throat> we continue to believe that these upfront investments will yield a longer-term return on investment than some of the ways in which traditional insurance operators work with uh, doing a, um, an entirely agent-based distribution, and then you've got less upfront expenses, but you've got a partner for life. 
Um, so that's really the way we view the, the path towards profitability. It will emerge um, as we turn this corner, we hit peak losses in the not too distant future, and then you will see these effects compounding all the way down to profitability. Great, thank you very much for the answers. The next question is from Yaron Kinar of Jeffries. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, so my first question, probably a continuation of, of um, the last uh, question and, and answer. Um, can, can you maybe give us a little more uh, color or data around the split between new and renewal uh, customers? Like, what, what does that look like? How's that been trending? So I think um, shifted somewhat to expanding our existing customers now that we have the ability to bundle and upsell and cross-sell at, at, at a greater level than we have in the past. So if you look at you know one of the metrics we publish is is net added customers, you'll see that vary quarter to quarter, and it's to kind of repeat gradually over time we're seeing more of our income coming from from existing existing customers um, metric for example um, uh, each uh, each customer that we add uh, longer it's still under a hundred percent but make as Daniel noted in Illinois you know where we've got the the, the broadest uh, higher results there, itching up to 90%. Um, so the breakdown, I mean, you, you, you've added, but um, change in the last several quarters approach, which is we want, we want to consistently increase the amount of premium coming from existing customers. Now that said, we're expanding, you know, into states we're not in with the the combination with Metro Mile that that'll enable us to do that more effectively with car product. Um, so you'll you'll continue to see a balance, um, but but the focus is really uh, more on uh, lifetime value, and that's increasing the retention of existing customers and increasing the the dollar premium potential value of new customers. And we're seeing that, you know, the, the more recent cohorts, as Shai noted, um, look quite strong. And so when you see the amount of uh, ad dollars we're, we're, we're continuing to put to work, that's because we can see that cohort activity later in, in our dashboards, we can see the, uh, you know, monthly and quarterly updates that look, look very promising. Okay. Um, and, and further down this path, um, spread between the loss ratios of new and renewal customers, um, or at least give us some direction. Is it improving? Is it deteriorating, staying stable? Um, and then maybe as a follow-up to that, with each renewal, do you continue to see an improvement in the loss ratio, or does that you know, over you know, two, three, four renewal? Hi, Aaron. Yeah, so we do see steady improvements over time when you look at the same cohort um, as it ages. Um, in our earlier comments, we spoke about lifetime loss ratio, and that's really what we have in mind. So we, you know, we don't measure the value of a customer by their loss ratio in the first few months, but really by the projected loss ratio over their lifetime. And we do see a fairly steady drop in loss ratio of cohorts that have been with us for three and four years. You'll see um, across the book a, a drop of oftentimes 15 or more percent from year one to year two, um, and something not altogether different from year two to year three. It does vary by product. Uh, we don't have enough years of cohorts, for example, in pet, let alone in car, but certainly that has been the dynamic in homeowners. Got it. Uh, one last one, if I could, really quick. Um, you, you talked a little bit about some of the data that you were observing in uh, Illinois as you launched uh, Hominade Car. Um, was the data similar in Tennessee? Was Tennessee just later uh, in the onboarding of CAR? I was just surprised not to see equivalent data. Yeah, it's just the launch of Tennessee was much more recent, that's all. So we're not seeing any significant uh, differences. It's only a few weeks of Tennessee. And we've got 
got a full quarter of Illinois. So that's just more substantial. But the, there's nothing in Tennessee that contradicts or, or it di diverges from what we've seen in, in uh, Illinois. Thank you for the, for the answers. The next question is from Jason Helstein of Oppenheimer. Impact your outlook for the next two years. Years, um, and then where where is the outsized impact on the P and L? Thanks. So uh, a couple thoughts, and um, car is similar in some ways and, and different in others. So we are, you know, historically we said that we're agnostic, you know, between the the types of premium we get. That's, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration. We we really do like a customer who has all the products. Types and so we, we do. Uh, we're seeing the value of that. We're seeing the specific impact in Illinois. So that that is important to us. That more policy for, for customers that, that that trend continue. Um, from a cost perspective, we've built a significant amount of the cost to support the car product. So we've got a, a product and development team that's in place. We've got a customer uh, experience and claim support infrastructure in place, and the the premium flow is is still in its early stages. It has been made. Uh, um, loss ratios will show some pressure, certainly versus renters, uh, which is a much more mature product and a, and a quite different product. But uh, I think the, the home and pet, in terms of our ability to launch a new product, uh, experience um, a period of time where we have less data, and we're, uh, we've shown a track record of being able to optimize fairly quickly. Uh, if you look at the track record of PET over the last two years, uh, of home over the last three years, um, there's been a consistent result, the challenging early periods, consistent optimization, and now heading toward what ultimately is our, our, our um, target LTV and, and, and target loss ratios. So... Um, We've got the infrastructure in place with CAR. I think the Metro Mile combination will um, fill a, a, a gap um, that we had with other products, which is a, a quick sort of a jump start to the experience, the data, you know, 100 million plus of, of in-force premium. So that will be different for our, for our CAR launch. We'll be able to come to market with a bit more data intelligence around um, a, a pay-as-you-go or a pay-per-mile product in addition to a more traditionally priced product. Um, and ultimately, we, you know, we, we view the, the primary goal is maximizing premium per customer, and that really means making car work for as many of our customers as, uh, as it's appropriate for. Maybe I'll just add two or three, three quick thoughts. Um, one is we've spoken about this before, but by our estimates, our existing customers are already spending over a billion dollars on car insurance. They just haven't had the opportunity of spending it with Lemonade. Um, and indeed, the majority of our sales so far of Lemonade Car in Tennessee and in Illinois have gone to existing customers, um, where our cost of acquisition was um, zero. So if that dynamic can scale, if we can continue to grow that book in part by acquiring new customers and generating new on-ramps to Lemonade by people who are searching for insurance that until now we didn't offer, complement that with offering it to existing customers, um, I think that will change the dynamics and the economics of our business pretty materially. It changes retention and dollar retention in particular in powerful ways as Illinois has demonstrated. Um, just think about the fact that today we're selling homeowners insurance with one hand tied behind our back because people do expect to bundle home and car and we can't do that. So we're effectively sending away our customers to our competitors who then offer them a bundle discount. Um, and to date, we've, we've not been able to contend with that head-on. As we roll out car, we will. So I think you'll get the boost, the obvious boost of selling car, the less obvious boost of selling car without as much of a CAC spend as you might imagine because of the cross-sell dynamic that I referenced, and thirdly, a boost to our homeowner's insurance because we'll be able to retain those customers and attract them by offering them something that until now we weren't able to. Um, the, the final thing I, I would just add is that um, in, in home and in pet, as, as Tim referenced, we've had a, a learning curve by generating our own data. Um, we've got multiple billions of miles of data coming to us from Metromile and a highly differentiated product. Our car product already launched, and this will 
just be compounded by the, all the capabilities that Metro will bring is a highly differentiated product. This is not the same car insurance product that's available on market today. And I think the advantages in terms of data from the telematics that we've spoken about in the past should compound over time pretty quickly. Got it, thank you. The next question is from Andrew Kleigerman of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, first, I uh, want to touch on expenses. Um, so tech and development uh, was uh, $16.9 million, up from 7.1 year over year. Uh, GNA uh, 282 versus 14 one year over year. And I think Tim was touching on headcount being up 76 uh, percent. Could you could you give a little color on uh, in tech and development uh, where the spend is greatest, what products, uh, where the focus is there? And same thing on GNA. Sure. Um... And I think uh, important to note a, a couple things about the expense flow. You're, you're uh, correct in the year and your comparison, and, and I think that's helpful. Um, I would note also that it's helpful to look at the sequential comparison as well. Um, and we'll put the queue out later today, and uh, but you can see most of it in our letter published yesterday. And what you'll see, you know, there's really two primary expense line drivers. It's people and it's marketing, you know, advertising, customer acquisition costs, and we've kind of touched on the customer acquisition cost. The year-on-year -year comparison for uh, people is fairly significant growth, but if you look at quarter-on-quarter -quarter or year-to-date, uh, we've really seen a break in the sequential pattern. Um, we've continued to hire uh, great folks, but the net ads over time uh, versus our sequential history is, has, has slowed rapidly. Uh, and that's a good thing. And what that means is um, we ramped up significantly over the course of 2021 of CAR. So we have the front load expenses. Uh, CAR was the most significant launch we've ever conducted. Um, but that's where you're seeing <clears throat> the bulk of that increase in R&D and product expense. That's what you see in the technology line. Those are the, the folks building that product. And so it's front-loaded. Uh, and now we're at a, at a point where we built that infrastructure that will continue to grow over time, but at a much more modest pace as the, as the premium increases. Um, so important to look at the sequential growth. Um, the, and the headcount, I think, that, you know, we, we, we give the number. Um, I would compare that to Q4, and you'll, you'll see the, the hard data that supports what I'm saying. From a G&A perspective, um, a couple things. One, uh, in the expense lines, those, of course, include uh, the stock-based compensation, and that has uh, spiked early because of a, of a higher historical stock price and, and past uh, equity grants. Uh, so backing out, backing it out from the cash perspective, Apple's um, cash expense. And finally, within the, the G&A line, we did have somewhat higher expenses in the professional services and legal area, which are not headcount driven. Uh, and so that um, uh, bumped up expenses in this quarter more notably than in the prior quarter. And probably uh, we'll see some benefit in the, in the next quarter, next couple of quarters, um, a little bit higher in Q1 than uh, the surrounding quarters in the GNA line. And, 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 and do you anticipate any big deltas in your, your G&A or, or tech and development once you bring Metro Mile versus where your expenses are now and versus where Metro Mile's expenses are? Or do you think both entities' expenses might be somewhat steady state? I would think of it um, in a couple of stages. Uh, you, you, you can see our expenses for Q1. You'll be able to see Metro Miles when they publish their figures, which is uh, either just happened or, or any moment. I think they're on the same schedule as we are, same quarterly schedule. Um, and so you'll see the current run rate, uh, stage one. Stage two is at the point where we bring 
uh, to happen before the before the end of the quarter. We're still optimistic that we're on track for that. So uh, likely third quarter would be the first quarter you'd see a consolidation of the two. Uh, I would expect a you know a, a step up certainly when we bring the two companies together. They're um, effective as of the, the the date they come together on a pro forma basis, um, and then you'll start to see um, as we bring the companies together and we're able to take out redundant costs. Metro Mile, for example, has all the required infrastructure costs of being a public company, as as do we, and so those are fixed sort of, uh, or not fixed, but those are their overhead costs that over time will, will dissipate as we bring the companies together. In addition, we have a hiring pace uh, in our expense line, in our guidance, in our going forward plan, a significant proportion of that planned hiring that, that's in our model will, will likely uh, come from Metro Mile. We know it'll come from Metro Mile. Uh, and so you'll see somewhat gradually Gradually, over a quarter or two, as we bring the companies together more formally, you'll start to see uh, us come toward a, a run rate that is more of a go-forward run rate. So it'll be less than just combining the two companies together, uh, you know, significantly less, uh, but obviously more so than uh, Lemonade standalone. Thanks. That was helpful. And just one more on um, <clears throat> the gross loss ratio of, of 90%. And I know somebody was asking a little bit about it earlier, but... Would it be possible for you to break out the underlying loss ratio, what the CATS piece was and what the prior year development piece of that was? So um, the, the, the stat filings will be out shortly, but at a high level, the, the prior period development uh, rounded to zero, uh, so no material development there. Uh, and then the CAT piece, as I mentioned, was in line with prior periods without a significant Cat. And so that tends to be, uh, you know, in the single single digits. Um, but really, but I think most importantly, I, we touched on this a little bit, but maybe to come back to it is um, the inflation impact is is significant. We, you know, it, it's hard in these early months where, where it's shifting uh, pretty quickly. It's hard to pinpoint it exactly. We don't we don't uh, obviously guide to it. Um, but if you just look at, at some of the metrics that are out there of, of today versus a year ago, you're seeing uh, effective inflation rates and all the key components that go into uh, home rebuilding and home repairs and things like that of, of uh, 5 or 10 or 15 percent uh, or, or more. And so it, it's, it's significant uh, in that loss ratio. Now, we're, we're not taking comfort that everything is fine and we just need to catch up with inflation, but that's it's significant. Um, I think, you know, probably also worth noting what, what we've done about it um, we've taken a significant, uh, continue to take significant steps in terms of rates and filings, um, which we had done historically on a consistent basis, but ramped up uh, in conjunction with the new inflation data we've gotten over the past year. Uh, something close to 100% of our uh, home and pet business will uh, be subject to new rate filings in the coming months uh, that will get us well, you, you, it's difficult to compensate for 100% of the inflation impact because it's a bit of a moving target. Uh, we, we think we'll be in the adjustments uh, where it's allowable by law. We'll have both of those components. We'll continue to put those components in place. Um, car is a little bit uh, – car is new, new for us, right? We're in one state, and we'll be rolling out in, in a number of states. So in some ways, it's easier for us to, to adjust as we go as we roll out, roll out new states. Um, so, you know, it, it's something that's clearly top of our radar list. You know, anytime you see uh, inflation rates of you know 20% or more, it's obviously uh, a serious thing. We've taken that into account, and you'll, you'll see it. Um, it's a bit of a lagging indicator, but you'll see the effects of these filings take place over the coming couple of months and quarters. No, no doubt, tough inflation. Maybe if I could just sneak one last one. Um, so, what is it about your dashboard that? tells you that you can get to that 75%? Is it the bundling? Is it renewals? Is it something else that, 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 that's in that dashboard telling you, you know, a 90 this quarter can go to a, a 75? Hey, Andrew. Um, thanks for that question. It, uh, the comment that Shai made was that the business that we acquired in quarter 
was showing a, a lifetime loss ratio of under 75%. Of course, our actual book loss ratio includes sales from three and four years ago, so we do carry forward that part of the business. It takes time to earn into these newer rates, but they, just to be precise, that's what Shai was talking about, was newly acquired uh, customers and, and their lifetime loss ratio. Now, that is derived from machine learning models. So we now have several years and over a million and a half customers as a training set for those machine learning models. And they are now able to predict with an increasing and pretty impressive rate of, of, um, of precision um, what, how likely a customer is to claim, how likely they are to churn, how likely they are to buy more products. And we use that in order to optimize our marketing campaigns that really generates for us a lifetime value. Um, we've, as I say, I've got a few years of history to test these models again, so we have, our confidence in them has grown uh, pretty significantly over the recent um, months as we see that they are just very good at telling us what these customers or how these customers will behave a year and two and three down the road. And it is those machine learned models and predictions that um, we were referring to in saying that newly acquired business, according to these machine learning models, will be profitable business and their loss ratio will be uh, sub-75. Okay, thank you. The next question is a follow-up from Michael Phillips of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for the follow-up opportunity. Um, your, your new homeowners customers, can you tell us either maybe specifically or just broadly, um, are, are those coming from graduations from renters or are they coming from purely new customers? It's not purely new customers at all. Um, we see in our condo business, which is – typically the, the most common upsell. So renters oftentimes will move from a rental to a condo and then from a condo to a homeowner's. Um, we've seen a, a steady increase in the percentage of our condo business that comes from graduation. I haven't checked it in the last couple of weeks, but it was just shy of 20% last time I looked at it, um, which is about double what the percentage was at our IPO a couple of years ago. So that has been a steady up and to the right increase. If memory serves across a book of homeowners, it's close to 15%. Um, I may be off by a percentage two or two, uh, percentage point or two, but that is um, broadly speaking where the, the how the percentages break down. The, the, the 15, Dan, the, the 15 was purely new, as so like 85 with graduation, 15 is purely new. Is that what you meant? No, no. I'm saying if you look at our, the totality yeah. of our homeowners book. And you ask okay. how many of the people who are today a homeowner, either condo or homeowners, um, about something about ballpark 15% of them started life with us as renters and then graduated. That number is increasing quarter on quarter. I believe every quarter since we launched pretty much we've seen that number increasing. And condo is ahead of um, homeowners, and that's closer to 20%. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The, the reason I ask is I think of you guys as being a homeowner's insurance company by by first going after the renters and then pleasing and delighting them, as you say, so that when they do mature and, you know, go through life stages, they then stay with you as, as they become a homeowner, as compared to specifically targeting your marketing towards homeowner's customers. And that, so that's how I think of you, and I'm going to make sure that's, you know, that's still accurate as the way you kind of um, go about getting, getting the homeowner's business. Yeah, it is accurate. Um, it is still the case that something close to 90% of our customers are joining us as first-time buyers of insurance. Um, oftentimes, the, the on-ramps that we spoke about, uh, renters, the, the thesis they just laid out for renters, is now repeating itself with other products as well. So PET affords another on-ramp, um, and people come looking for PET, and then we'll add those other products. But in broad strokes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. The next question is from Tracy Ben Guizzi of Barclays. Please go ahead. Good morning. Apologies, I had to join this call late. Was on another earnings call, so if my question was already asked. My apologies. Um, could you quantify the rate increases you're seeking in your 100 filings, and if you're getting any pushback right, by regulators as they're trying to protect their constituents who are also facing higher inflationary pressures? 
Um, hi, Tracy, good morning. The question was not asked, so thank you for that. Um, it varies tremendously from product to product and state to state. So it wouldn't be responsible for me to um, give you kind of a blanket answer for that. It, it really is a, a matrix of um, three or four by 50, um, and we try to do this with tremendous precision. And in fact, even that in large measure understates things because rather than just doing um, kind of crude base rate increases, we do use all the data that we gather in order to become more and more refined in our segmentation. And even as we raise weight rates in California for a particular product, we might be decreasing it for some customers, increasing it for other customers. So uh, um, it is a fairly complex matrix. And yes, of course, we do get pushed back. Um, there are places where it's harder and easier or slower or faster to get rates approved. Um, I think the state of California has earned a special place in the, in the hearts of insurers nationwide for being a place that it's been tricky, particularly for homeowners, to take a rate commensurate with the risk. And we've seen a, an outflow of a lot of um, insurance companies from that state for that reason. So I'm not sure it's actually protecting consumers. It's actually making it harder for them to get insured. Um, but yes, in, in some states and for some products, it's harder than in other areas. Okay. And are you including an inflation guard um, in your homeowner policy to complement rate increases? I think that you can implement it right away. Yeah, so we do have um, inflation guard approved um, in most states um, for our homeowners' products. Uh, so we do have that capability, but we're doing something beyond that. Um, we're doing a couple of things beyond that. So. One is we are doing broad base rate increases. I spoke about the subtleties of segmentation, but when it comes to just keeping um, track, tracking inflation, um, then we can do kind of base rate increases in order to keep track with inflation. And in some parts of our business, it's very necessary. Um, Tim spoke about some of these numbers before, but to add some color, uh, the National Association of Home Builders say that rates in, for construction have risen 10% in five months, 20% in 12 months and over 30% over the last 24 months. So some areas like car, like home, are suffering hyperinflation, not just the inflation that we read about in the papers. Um, and so we are taking broad measures to keep, uh, keep up with, with inflation. But beyond that, um, actually built into our system, I referenced this um, earlier, um, built into our system is the ability to adapt, uh, or up, update rather, Cov A, which is the construction replacement cost in a homeowner's policy to update that every time that policy is renewed. So we have access to fairly broad and deep and current databases so that we can gauge with, um, with increasing accuracy more than we ever had before, how much it would actually cost to affect that replacement or repair. Um, and for both new product, new customers and on renewal, we are using the latest and greatest estimates. So inflation does flow that way as the limits increase because the costs have increased, the rate tax to that pretty accurately. And if in the past we were a little bit more tolerant in our underwriting guidelines, allowing people to um, select a, a replacement cost that is lower than what our databases are suggesting, we gave a 20% wiggle room in the past. Newer underwriting guidelines are tightening that up as well. And we won't be ensuring um, homes whether um, ratio is less than 100%. So you'll be in, in trusting these data sets and insisting on their implementation, and that should keep us continuously adapting to inflation as well. Is there any shift to move to actual cash value from replacement costs? No, our policies are replacement costs. It's what our customers expect. We pride ourselves on that. Um, there's no, no talk of changing that. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session and today's conference. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.